Once upon a time, there were three brothers, triplets, named Tom, Dick, and Harry Class. They were raised in the same home with the same parents, had the same IQ, same skills, and same opportunities. Each was married and had two children. They were all carpenters making $25 per hour. While they were very similar in all these respects, they had different priorities. For example, Tom chose to work 20 hours per week, while his brother Dick worked 40 hours, and Harry, 60. It should also be noted that Harry's wife worked full-time as an office manager for a salary of $50,000. Dick's wife sold real estate part-time 10 hours a week and made $25,000 per year. Tom's wife did not work. Tom and Dick spent all of their family income. Since they paid into Social Security, they figured they didn't need to save for retirement. Harry and his wife, on the other hand, had, over many years, put away money each month and invested it in stocks and bonds. Here's how it worked out. Tom made $25,000 a year. Dick and his wife made $75,000. And Harry and his wife, $150,000. When a new housing development opened up in their community, the brothers decided to buy equally priced homes on the same private street. One day, the brothers decided to pool their funds for the purpose of improving their street. Concerned about crime and safety, and wanting a more attractive setting for their homes, the three families decided to install a security gate at the street's entrance, repave the street's surface, and enhance the lighting and landscaping. The work was done for a total cost of $30,000. Harry assumed they would divide the bill three ways, each brother paying $10,000. But Tom and Dick objected. Hmm. Why should we pay the same as you? They said, you make much more money than we do. Harry was puzzled. What does that have to do with anything, he asked. My family makes more money because my wife and I work long hours and because we have saved some of the money we've earned to make additional money from investments. Why should we be penalized for that? Harry, you can work and save all you like, Tom countered. But my wife and I want to enjoy ourselves now, not 25 years from now. Fine, Tom, do what you want. It's a free country. But why should I have to pay for that? I can't believe you're being so unbrotherly, Tom argued. You have a lot of money and I don't. I thought you'd be more generous. Hmm. At this point, Dick, the peacemaker in the family, entered the conversation. I've got an idea, Dick said. Our combined income is $250,000, and $30,000 is 12% of that amount. Why don't we each pay that percentage of our income? Under that formula, Tom would pay $3,000, I would pay $9,000, and Harry would pay $18,000. I have a much better idea, said Tom, and one that's fairer than what you're proposing. Dick and Harry turned to Tom. Harry should pay $23,450. Dick, you should pay $6,550. And I will pay nothing. To Dick, this sounded completely arbitrary and not really fair, but it did have one big plus. His share would be $2,450 less under Tom's formula than under his own. So he decided to be silent. Harry, however, was stunned. You want me to pay almost 80% of the bill despite the fact that each of us is receiving the exact same benefits? Where did you get such a crazy idea? From no less an authority than the U.S. government, Tom responded as he pulled out a gray booklet. It's all right here in the IRS tax tables. This is the progressive income tax system all U.S. taxpayers live under, and I don't see why we should be any different. In fact, I believe all future improvements should be paid in this way. Works for me, said Dick. So, by a vote of two to one, the cost of the street improvements was divided as Tom had proposed, even though they benefited equally, and even though the reason Harry had more money was that he and his wife had worked many more hours than his brothers and their wives, and had saved some of what they had earned, instead of spending it all. Tom and Dick lived happily ever after with their new arrangement. Harry grumbled a lot, but whenever he complained, his brothers called him greedy, and selfish. The end. Let's discuss an important concept from economics, the Laffer Curve. This concept is named after the man who developed it, 
Arthur Laffer, a major American economist who has taught at the University of Chicago, University of Southern California, and elsewhere. The Laffer curve illustrates the two most important things we need to know about taxes, how much money the government can raise from taxes, and at what level of taxation the government might start getting less, not more revenue. The Laffer curve is illustrated here by a two-dimensional graph. The horizontal line is the tax rate that the government chooses, and the vertical line is the revenue that the government receives from that tax rate. First, because zero times any number is zero, if the tax rate is zero, then the government receives zero revenue. Accordingly, zero, zero is our first point on the curve. Now suppose the government chooses a very small tax rate, say 1%. The government will then begin to receive some revenue from citizens. This means that another point in the curve must be something like this. Now suppose the government charges a 2% tax rate. Then everyone would agree that it will receive even more revenue, which means that another point in the curve must be something like this. And if the government keeps raising the rate, then revenue will continue to go up, at least when we're in the low tax rate part of the graph. This means that if we fill in the curve, it has an upward slope, at least when we're in the low tax rate part of the graph. Now suppose the government charges a 100% tax rate. If this happens, then no one would work. That is, why would anyone work when the government is going to take all the money that they make? And if no one works, then national income would be zero. This means that government revenue would be 100% of zero, or zero. This means that another point of the curve must be here. Now, let's complete the curve. When we do, we see that the curve must have a hump. That is, it could look like this, or this, or this. But it has to have a hump. This is simply because the revenue line has to go up in the low tax rate part of the graph, and it has to start going down to reach the point we drew at the 100% tax rate. But if the curve slopes downward, it implies something remarkable, something that few of those who push for higher and higher taxes want to admit. It means that when tax rates are high, if you make them higher, you'll actually bring in less revenue to the government. This has, in fact, occurred in practice. For instance, during the Great Depression, when Congress passed the Hawley Smoot Tariff Bill, Although the bill raised taxes on imported goods, the revenue that came from those taxes actually decreased. A more recent example occurred in the early 1980s. After President Reagan and Congress drastically reduced the tax rates on the rich, the tax revenue that came from the rich actually increased. All economists, even the most left-wing ones, agree that the true Laffer curve, the one that reflects real life, has a hump. Now, therefore, the curve has a downward sloping part, meaning at some point, tax revenues start going down when you increase rates. So where then do economists disagree? They disagree about exactly where the hump occurs. When I took my first economics class in 1984 at Stanford University, the textbook said that the hump occurs somewhere around the 70% tax rate. But apparently, I was taught something wrong. New evidence from an unexpected source suggests that the hump occurs at a much lower tax rate, something around 33%. That source is a study by Christina Romer and her husband, David Romer. Both are economics professors at the University of California, Berkeley. Christina Romer was the chairman of President Barack Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. In other words, the study was written by one of the most influential liberal economists in the United States, and it was published in the American Economic Review, the most widely respected economics journal in the world. The study examined how national income responds to tax rates. But as far as what concerns us here, the key point is that if you do the math, the results imply that the hump on the Laffer curve occurs where the tax rate is around 33%, much lower than economists previously thought. Let's now put these findings into political terms. They suggest that no matter what your politics, you should not want tax rates to be above 33%. Obviously, conservatives and many moderates think rates should be lower than that, but even if you are an extreme left-winger and your only goal is to make government as big as possible, you should still oppose a tax rate higher than 33%. The reason is that, as the Romer and Romer study suggests, when tax rates go higher than that, the government actually gets less money. 
Everyone of every political persuasion should pay attention to the Romer and Romer study and its important implications. They suggest that if we decrease tax rates, government revenues might actually rise. I'm Tim Grossclose, professor of political science and economics at UCLA for Prager University. Here's a question you're likely to hear whenever the subject of taxes comes up. Do the rich pay their fair share? There are two parts to this question. Who is rich and what is fair? Let's start with who is rich. Nearly everyone assumes that a person who is among the top 10% of all income earners qualifies as rich. But according to 2011 data, a top 10% household makes around $150,000 or above in gross annual income. That's income before deductions and taxes. Now, $150,000 is a nice living, but it certainly doesn't make you rich. Okay then, what about the top 5%? You get into this percentile if your household makes around $190,000 or above. That's a nice bump, but it hardly puts you in the rich category. How about the top 1%? That's $500,000 or above. A great income. But remember, most people only get to that level after many years of hard work and quite possibly the accumulation of serious debt to fund their education or build their business. Of course, there are people who make more than 500000 and there are some who make many millions, even billions. But the number who do is very small. Now let's talk about FAIR. FAIR would seem to be that the group of taxpayers who earn 10% of the country's income would pay 10% of the country's taxes. The group who earned 20% would pay 20% of the taxes, and so on. But what if I told you that according to IRS data, the top 10% of all earners, the people making $150,000 and above, pay 71% of all federal income tax while earning only 43% of all income? If anything, the top 10% pay more than their fair share. So, as it happens, do the much-reviled top 1%. They earn 17% of all income, but pay 37% of all federal income taxes. And what about those at the other end of the income scale, the lower earners? Are we squeezing them? Hardly. Those who make 45000 or less, 47% of all earners, pay little and often no income taxes. Ah. But what about payroll taxes, the money we pay to fund Social Security and Medicare? That takes a bigger bite of the paycheck of lower earners than higher earners. Isn't that unfair? Consider two points. First, it's misleading to call the payroll tax a tax. It's really an insurance payment that guarantees we receive Social Security and Medicare after we turn 65. Second, the benefits we receive from Social Security are capped, no matter how much we have paid in. This means that the payroll taxes of high earners actually help subsidize the Social Security and Medicare benefits that low earners receive at retirement. How do all these numbers stack up against other countries? The U.S. income tax system is substantially more progressive, meaning that income tax rates rise as income rises than other advanced countries, including Germany and Sweden. So if you think that our tax system is unfair because it coddles high earners, then you must conclude that tax systems in these other countries are even more unfair. So how high are tax rates on Americans today? Well, throw in federal tax increases mandated in 2013 and state taxes and top earners face a tax rate of more than 50% in California and New York. Other states like Maryland and Connecticut are not far behind. Do you think a tax rate of greater than 50% is fair? If so, is there any rate that wouldn't be? Nobody's calling for bake sales for anyone in the top 10% of earners. And no one wants to minimize the struggles of those at the lower income strata. But to say the rich, however you might define them, don't pay their fair share is simply wrong. Finally, numerous academic studies, including ones that I have done, show that when tax rates are too high, investment, risk-taking by entrepreneurs, 
and therefore job creation all decline. And when that happens, it's the poor who suffer, not the rich. The rich do fine. It may feel good to take even more money from the top 10%, but it doesn't do good, and it sure isn't fair. I'm Lee Ohanian, Professor of Economics at UCLA for Prager University. The American Revolution started as a tax revolt over a single tax on tea. Now look at us. It seems like everything we do is taxed. The system behind these taxes is a bureaucratic monstrosity, a dead weight on the economy. And it erodes our trust in the government that's taxing us. If you have enough lawyers, lobbyists, and loopholes at your disposal, maybe you can game the system. That's fine for big corporations and wealthy individuals, but what about the small business owner or the middle class taxpayer? He just has to shut up and pay up. Nothing illustrates the disaster that our tax system has become than the mother of all taxes, the Federal Income Tax Code. This tax alone, with all its attendant rulings and interpretations, is estimated to be about 10 million words and rising. Several years ago, Money Magazine took a hypothetical family's finances and gave the numbers to 46 tax preparers. 46 different estimates came back. In some cases, those differences ran into the thousands of dollars of what the family owed. This from experts who are considered to be the best in the business. But the taxes themselves are only part of the cost of this toxic code. There's also the cost of compliance, the time, money, and effort it takes for Americans to prepare their taxes. A George Mason University study puts the annual cost of compliance as high as $378 billion, and the total annual economic cost, including work hours, at more than $600 billion. Again, these are annual costs, as in every year. That's a lot of money that could be used in more productive ways, creating new products, new services, new medical devices, new cures for diseases. Clearly, the time has come to drive a stake through the heart of this tax monster. So what should be done? Like most things, the best solution is the most simple. A single flat tax with no deductions, except for a deduction for each adult and for each child. Fill out a sheet of paper or key in a few numbers on your computer and you're done. This one change would not only make every citizen's life easier, would also transform government, our economy, and our society by ending the complexity that gives bureaucrats and politicians so much power. They have power because they're the ones who dole out the tax favors. It wasn't always this way. There was a time when corporations primarily lobbied Washington to keep government out of their businesses. That has changed. In the words of the Atlantic, the evolution of business lobbying from a sparse reactive force into a ubiquitous and increasingly proactive one is among the most important transformations in American politics over the last 40 years. This favor seeking is centered on getting special treatment and tax breaks. A flat tax will help us begin to scale back that special interest loving, crony capitalist big government that we all complain about. Everyone would pay less, not only in taxes, but also in compliance. Investment and job creation would skyrocket. We'd experience a recovery that would grow the tax base and, irony of ironies, ultimately generate more revenue for government. I go into this in much greater detail in my book, Reviving America, but here in essence is how it works. Everyone, individuals and corporations, pays a 17% flat rate. This single rate is absolutely critical. Whenever we have two or more tax rates, they're like rabbits, they breed. We saw that with the 1986 tax reforms, which consisted of two rates. They've since multiplied into the seven we have today. Well, you might argue, this sounds great for the rich and even the middle class, but what about the poor? 17% is a big burden. That's why under this plan, a family of four who makes less than $52,800 would pay no income tax. That's double the current federal poverty level. This will let people at low income levels keep more of their money. And for those who think the rich should pay more, they will. Prior to the passage of the tax cuts that President Ronald Reagan pushed through Congress in 1981, the top 1% of American earners accounted for nearly 18% 
of federal personal income tax revenue. By 1988, that same group accounted for nearly 28%, an increase of 10 percentage points in only seven years. By eliminating loopholes and requiring everyone to pay their fair share, the flat tax offers a model of tax fairness. More than 40 countries and jurisdictions have enacted the flat tax. When all the facts are considered, the real question is not whether America should implement this vital reform, but what are we waiting for? It's time for another tax revolution. I'm Steve Forbes for Prager University. Tax the rich some more. That recommendation comes from many politicians. It seems obvious to tax the rich. We tell ourselves they won't miss that little extra bit we take. And after all, it's only right that they pay their fair share. The technical name for taxing the rich more is progressivity. And it's hard to oppose a concept that shares its roots with an optimistic word like progress. But this surface logic obscures some important truths about progressivity. So let's stand back. The first thing we see when we take our distance is surprising. It is that many people don't know what progressivity is. Supposing you pay $5 in tax on your income. A rich man pays $10 because he makes twice as much as you. This arrangement sounds like progress, right? But that is not a progressive tax schedule. It is a proportional one, a true fair share, what was once known as the tithe, but is now commonly called a flat tax. Under a flat tax, everyone pays the same rate no matter what they earn. In the 1980s, a poll by political scientist Carlin Keene suggested that Americans thought flat proportional taxes were fair taxes. And as we know from architecture and art, humans are wired to like proportionality. A progressive tax structure, by contrast, is actually disproportionate. Progressivity resembles a flight of stairs. Each individual starts out at the bottom, paying the same rate, say 10%. When his income rises to a certain line, the taxpayer moves up the step on the staircase and his rate goes up to, say, 20%, but only for the share of income past that line. And the next step, the rate goes up again, say, to 30%, but again, only for the last stair of income, and so on. But the prospect of going up all those stairs tires the climber. Surveying the rates at the top, workers stop chasing a promotion they once thought they wanted. Why bother? The tax man will take the money anyhow. When workers or professionals stall on the stairs, the government loses money. But so do regular people, for when the person who decides not to earn more money is a business owner, the result of that decision is a smaller company and fewer jobs for others. Of course, some people do keep climbing no matter what. Some people are wired that way. And those taxpayers can get to the point where they pay half of what they earn, especially in high-tax states, which leads to the greatest argument against the progressivity staircase. Progressivity is unjust. People have a right to what they earn even Californians and New Yorkers. But politicians like being able to say that they are ensuring that the rich pay their share, and nothing proves their anti-rich credentials like sponsoring fresh legislation for more progressivity. So for years, president after president, Democrat and Republican, and Congress after Congress have passed law after law to make the income tax more progressive. President Richard Nixon signed a law that took 9 million taxpayers at the bottom end off the income tax staircase entirely. Other presidents, like Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton, took a few more million out. George W. Bush removed even more. So today, nearly half of Americans pay no income tax at all. And 10% of earners pay 70% of all income tax. Talk about disproportionate. Here we get to a genuine question of fairness. There's something wrong with our democracy when people who pay no tax can vote for tax increases on fellow citizens who already do pay tax. But reversing a century of progressivity won't be easy. For when you cut taxes for all in a progressive rate structure, the rich necessarily get a larger tax break. That is so because they pay a greater share to begin with. And advocating larger breaks for the rich is not a popular political move, to put it mildly. Many economists make the case for a true flat tax. Others tout a sales tax, 
Consumers would then pay taxes only on what they buy. Either way, it's time for politicians to give up their small talk about the earned income credit, the child credit, and so on, and get out their saws to dismantle the big staircase, our disproportionate progressive income tax. The country could then try a tax code that's simple and easy to navigate, like a new road that runs straight ahead into the horizon. Many of us would call that progress. I'm Amity Schles for Prager University. Life isn't fair. And you know what? It can't be. Here's the problem. The word fair doesn't mean justice or equity or indeed anything very specific. Instead, it's become a sort of all-purpose statement of moral superiority. Superiority tinged paradoxically with victimhood. Now, fairness does have an exact meaning in certain contexts. For example, if we're playing a game, fairness means that the rules should be applied impartially. When we're kids and our parents and teachers set the rules, the word still has that essential meaning. It's a young person's way of demanding what we might call equality before the law. But as we get older, the word becomes more of a whine. In the mouth of a teenager, trust me on this, it's not fair means, more often than not, you won't let me do something I want. In recent years, though, something odd has happened. Adults have started using the word in much the same way that teenagers do. More than in any previous generation, people today retain their teenage sense of self-centeredness. They use it's not fair as a catch-all complaint, as an assertion of wounded entitlement. Look at a Google graph of the use of the word fairness. From around 1965, it looks like the proverbial hockey stick. Flat, and then it suddenly shoots up. We've developed a fairness obsession. But what do we mean when we use the word? Do we mean justice? Do we mean equality? Do we mean need? Or do we mean something else? Suppose you and Jane buy a cake together. You pay $6 and Jane pays $4. What would be the fair way? to split it up. You could do it on the basis of proportionality. In other words, you get 60% of the cake and Jane gets 40%. Or you could do it on the basis of strict egalitarianism, half each regardless of who paid what. Or you could do it on the basis of wealth. Jane has much less money than you for non-essentials like cake, so maybe she should get the larger share. A case can be made for each approach. But the beauty of the word fair is that it doesn't require you to come down clearly in favour of any of them. It gives you the cover of ambiguity. So, for example, when a politician says, we want the rich to pay their fair share, he doesn't usually mean that he wants the rich to pay taxes at the same rate as everyone else. He means that he wants them to pay extra. The word fair lets him present higher rates of taxation as a form of justice. But only if we don't think about it too hard. That's the beauty of it. Fair doesn't ultimately mean proportionate or impartial or equal. You can use it to mean almost any positive thing you like. I want fairness generally means, look at me, I'm a nice person. Demanding fairness lets you tell the world how decent you are without your actually having to contribute a penny. It's a kind of vanity. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? Let's get real. The only way to distribute the cake is to see how much people are prepared to pay for their slice. Sure, that could leave a banker with a bigger slice than a baker. Sure, we might not like that distribution. We might feel that the baker is doing something more valuable than the banker. He's making delicious pastries while the money man doesn't seem to be making anything except money for himself. But how can we judge someone else's economic worth? You might want bakers to be paid more than bankers. I might want teachers to be paid more than movie stars. Since we all have our own preferences, the only way to measure the economic value of a service is to see how much others are prepared to pay for it. That's what the market does. It aggregates our preferences. It doesn't ask us in the abstract what we think someone else deserves. It tests in reality how many hours of our own labour we're prepared to put in 
in exchange for a product or a service. Under every other economic system, our relations are mediated by accidents of birth and social caste, and financial rewards are determined by favoritism. The free market alone gives everyone the same rights. My money is as good as yours. You can't get fairer than that. I'm Daniel Hannan, President of the Initiative for Free Trade and author of Inventing Freedom for Prager University. This video was made possible by a generous donation from the David and Janet Pollock Foundation. Ever since Franklin Roosevelt promised Americans a new deal in 1932, liberal politicians and pundits have insisted that the government must do more to alleviate poverty, increase economic security, and enhance the quality of life. But the word more implies there's a level of government activity that would be enough. In reality, however, there's never enough. That's because the liberal theory and practice of activist government is an endless pursuit of a goal that can't be achieved. When was the last time you heard a liberal politician say, yeah, we solved that social ill. We're just going to close up that government agency now, zero out the budget, and move on to another problem. What you hear instead is that we need more. And more always sets the stage for still more down the road. Liberalism's lack of a limiting principle raises two questions. First, can our republic govern itself on this basis? Second, should it? My answers are maybe and no. Maybe we can go on, at least for a while, to continue to expand entitlement spending. We've been doing it for decades. Adjusted for inflation and population growth, government spending, federal, state, and local, was nearly seven times as large in 2014 as it was in 1948. That sounds like a perfect example of the economist's adage, if something can't go on forever, it won't. In 1948, government spending amounted to 17%, just over one-sixth of our gross domestic product, the total value of all the goods and services produced by the American economy that year. In 2014, government spending was 32% of GDP, just under one-third. This trend puts us on a steady course to a European social democracy, one where government spends more than 50% of GDP. Europe is straining under this burden. France, for example, the third largest economy in the European Union, has stagnant growth and unemployment twice as high as America's. Even nations with stronger economies, such as Sweden and Germany, face the dilemma of welfare states around the world. The number of workers paying taxes continues to decline, while the number of beneficiaries, those who receive government benefits, continues to grow. America has the same problem. As it is, government spending on social welfare and insurance programs, the part of the budget liberals like best, is crowding out everything else. Such spending accounted for 72% of federal outlays in 2014, twice the proportion in 1969. Common sense suggests this can't go on indefinitely. Which brings us to the second question. Should America govern itself on this basis? That is, should America become like Europe? Liberals say yes, conservatives say no. Conservatives insist that the European model is wrong for America, even if we can afford it. The key to this argument is that America's founding did not just establish a government, but defined a nation with a distinct character. Healthy skepticism of government, even when it announces the intention to use its power benevolently, is a central feature of that character. The don't tread on me spirit that animated the founding remains strong. Most Americans persist in believing that a government powerful enough to give you everything you want will also necessarily be powerful enough to take away everything you have, including your freedom. Conservatives believe that government power must be limited because the alternative is unlimited government. Liberals don't share this concern. If there's a social problem, they believe the best solution is a new government program. 
If it fails to achieve its goal, which it invariably does, the solution is a bigger government program, more. And when does more become enough? The honest answer is never. I'm Bill Vogley of the Claremont Institute for Prager University. The rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. The top 1% of people on the planet have half the wealth. Western corporations are plundering developing countries. Capitalism is on its last legs. Really? The truth is that global inequality is tumbling. Yeah, the rich are getting richer, but the poor are getting richer faster. And what's driving that process? The market. Look at the most basic measures. Literacy, longevity, infant mortality, calorie intake, height. More and more people are being lifted out of poverty. I think of the changes just in my lifetime. When I was born in 1971, an American worker had to earn a month's salary to be able to afford a TV set. Now it's two days. In 1971, fewer than half of girls worldwide completed at least primary education. Now it's more than 90%. In 1971, a stationary car emitted more pollution than a car moving at full speed today. Go a little further back. In the 17th century, the most powerful man in the world was Louis XIV of France. Every night, he'd have 40 dishes prepared for his dinner, and he'd pick the one that he felt like. But think about it. A receptionist today can stop off at a store on her way home and have not only a wider choice than that king, but a fresher one and a healthier one. We all live better than Louis XIV. And what's caused that miracle? Not any UN development program, not any government aid scheme. What caused it was the market. The most rapid falls in poverty are happening in countries that are joining the global trading system. Compare growth rates in free trading Colombia and protectionist Venezuela, or in free trading Vietnam and protectionist Laos, or in free trading Bangladesh and protectionist Pakistan. It's the same story every time. China after 1979, India after 1991. You remove barriers to trade, prices fall, your people no longer have to work every hour just to afford food and basic commodities. They have time to invent and make and buy and sell other things. The whole economy is stimulated, poverty falls. Okay, you might say. So maybe capitalism works, maybe people are better off. But isn't there a cost? Doesn't it make us more materialistic? Doesn't it make us greedier? Well, if by greed you mean a desire for material wealth, that's part of the human condition. It's in our DNA. Or if you prefer, it's in our fallen nature. Under any system, socialism, communism, fascism, absolute monarchy, theocracy, people want more stuff. The unique quality of capitalism is that it structures the incentives so that the way to succeed, the way to be greedy if you insist on using that vocabulary, is to offer a service to the people around you. Under every other system, you get on by sucking up to those in power, commissars or kings or dictators. But under a free market system, you get on by offering consumers something they want. As the economist Joseph Schumpeter put it, the achievement of capitalism is not to provide more silk stockings for princesses, but to bring them within the reach of the shop girl. So, why can't we see it? Why do well-intentioned, idealistic young people oppose free trade and market liberalization, thinking that they're standing up for the poorest people on the planet, when in fact they're doing the opposite? A big part of the answer is aesthetic. As the Victorian novelist Anthony Trollope wrote, poverty to be scenic, should be rural. I grew up in Lima, Peru, which in those days was surrounded by shanty towns known as Las Barriadas. Western visitors would come and they'd visit Machu Picchu, and then they'd ask in bewilderment why people migrated from the Andes to the slums. Why did they swap the clean air and the mountain scenery for open sewers and traffic fumes? It's a very first world question. No Peruvian ever needed to ask why you'd leave a place with no electricity, no school, no clinic, and no jobs. 
those shanty towns, those barriadas, for most of their residents are transitional. They're busy places, humming with enterprise, and the people in them sense that they're on their way up. If we want to help those people, the best thing we can do is let them sell us their stuff. Capitalism has achieved things which earlier ages ascribed to gods and magicians. It's abolishing hunger and disease and want. It's led to an unprecedented enrichment that is the central fact of your life. The fact that you're watching this video is enough to tell me that. Now, let it work its magic in the rest of the world. I'm Daniel Hannan for Prager University. Both Democrats and Republicans complain about America's national debt, what a looming crisis it is, and how we have to do something about it. And well, they should. The numbers defy comprehension. Currently, the debt stands at around $17 trillion, much of that coming in just the last few years. To put it simply, our government spent $17 trillion more than it took in. That's one huge deficit, wouldn't you say? How did it happen? To answer that, we have to focus on three programs, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Social Security is a government pension program for people over 65. Medicare is a government health insurance program for people over 65. And Medicaid is a government health assistance program for people who can't afford to buy insurance. The debt picture has admittedly become a little more complicated and more severe because of the massive increases in government spending on unemployment benefits and other federal assistance programs related to the 2009 recession. But the big three, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, remain at the center of the problem. In fact, spending in every other area, including defense, all other appropriations, and other federal entitlements, though significant, make up a smaller share of the economy than has historically been the case. These three programs are not new. The first Social Security check was issued on January 31, 1940. Medicaid and Medicare came into existence in the mid-60s during the administration of Lyndon Johnson. All three programs were greatly expanded in 1972 during the Nixon administration. And every year they gobble up more and more of the federal budget. How much more? Just listen to these numbers from the Congressional Budget Office. In 1970, these three programs accounted for 21% of all federal spending. By 2012, they accounted for 42% of all federal spending. And now, we've added a fourth new federal assistance program, the Affordable Care Act of 2010, otherwise known as Obamacare. Just to give you one example, Medicare Part B, the part of Medicare that covers doctor services, was originally projected to cost $500 million a year. In 2012, it cost $164 billion. Whatever you think about the value of these programs, how are we going to pay for them? The Congressional Budget Office projects that before today's 25-year-olds are ready to receive Medicare, these four programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and the Affordable Care Act, are expected to cost more than all the money the government collects in taxes. That would mean we would have to borrow money to pay for everything else. Our armed forces, road repair, everything. So what do we do? Well, we could increase taxes. Massively. But to raise the kind of money we'd need, we'd have to significantly increase taxes on everybody, especially the middle class. That means taking a lot more money out of your paycheck and mine. Because if you think we could get what we need from the rich, well, think again. If we took all the earnings of people who make more than a million dollars, a 100% income tax, that would only net us a little more than $600 billion. And obviously, we could only do that once. The second answer, and much more practical one, is to cut spending, specifically cut the rate of growth of the three legacy programs, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. 
That doesn't mean spending less money than we already are. It simply means not increasing our spending as fast as we have been. Social Security would be a good place to start. In 1940, the average life expectancy of an individual in the United States was less than 65, the age at which people begin to get Social Security. Today, average life expectancy in the U.S. is almost 80. Obviously, it's time to move the age at which Americans receive Social Security to reflect our longer lifespan. There are a lot of common sense reform ideas out there, but if we don't enact a few of them soon, we are just going to continue to watch the debt grow bigger and bigger. This issue, controlling spending, should be of intense interest to everyone, but especially Americans under 30. If we go on spending much more than we take in, they're the ones who are going to be left holding the bag. So the next time a politician proposes a generous new government benefits program, the first question should be, where is the money going to come from to pay for it? And if he or she is honest, there's only one answer, from you. I'm Michael Tanner of the Cato Institute for Prager University. There's been a lot said and a lot written about income inequality, about how unfair it is that a few people are very rich and the rest of us aren't, that the income gap between the wealthy and even the middle class, let alone the poor, is so large. There's only one problem with this complaint. It's wrong. Income inequality is actually a good thing when it's the product of a free market economy. And your own life proves it. An economy is made up of millions of individuals making decisions about their own lives, where and how much they want to work, what they want to buy, and so on. You are one of those individuals. In a country like the United States, you are free to pursue a path in life that you believe best suits your talents. That talent might be teaching, or making music, or banking, or starting a small business, or raising a family. Whatever it is, this freedom helps to make life enjoyable, exciting, and meaningful. But it's also an expression of inequality. This is simply because we're all different. We have different talents, different temperaments, different ambitions. That's okay because, again, in a free society, we can seek out opportunities that play to our personal strengths, that distinguish us from others. If you find what you're really good at and work hard, you might have great success and make a lot of money. If you're an outstanding athlete, I'll buy a ticket to see you play. If you're a savvy investor, I'll give you some of my money to invest. As long as you have the freedom to guide your own destiny, you have a chance to reach your full potential, achieving success however you define it. But if someone, say a government bureaucrat, told you that your ambition had limits, that there was a ceiling above which you could not rise, I doubt you'd be happy about it. You'd feel like you're in a straitjacket. Forced equality means less opportunity to pursue what makes you individually great. But what about the growing gap between the rich, the 1%, and the rest of us, the 99% that one hears so much about? Isn't that a bad thing? Again, the answer is no. Here's why. In a free market economy, people become wealthy, making what the rich enjoy today into something almost everybody can enjoy tomorrow. The rich are the test buyers. Consider the cell phone. Now we all have them, but when Motorola manufactured the first one in 1983, it was the size of a brick, had a half hour of battery life, reception was terrible, and calls were very expensive. It cost $4,000. But if no one had bought that $4,000 brick, there wouldn't be a $40 cell phone today. In the 1960s, a computer cost over a million dollars. Nowadays, thanks to billionaires like Michael Dell, we have incredibly advanced computers that cost us a few hundred dollars. Remember what an out of reach luxury flat screen TVs once were? Only the rich could afford them. Today, your living room is essentially your own private cinema. The free market is about turning scarcity into abundance. What was once available to the few is now available to the many. Wealth inequality is an important corollary to that truth. So, should I resent the people who became wealthy because they have more money than I do? Or should I be grateful for the economic system that allows them to enrich my life and the lives of millions of other people? This feature of the free market, income inequality, can appear terribly unfair. But with a little further investigation, the real picture becomes clear. 
Income inequality makes what once seemed like impossible luxuries available to almost everyone. It provides the incentive for creative people to gamble on new ideas. It promotes personal freedom and rewards hard work, talent, and achievement. In sum, income inequality signals that individual liberty, opportunity, and innovation are all present in a free economy. Pretty good for something that's supposed to be so bad. Two final points. The 1% Club is always open to new members. And you don't have to be in the top 1% to have a very good life. And that, not the existence of the very wealthy, is what matters most. I'm John Tamney, editor of Real Clear Markets for Prager University. I want to talk to you about three words that should scare the heck out of you, especially if you're young. Public pension liabilities. Okay, I know you probably have about a hundred things you're worried about, and public pension liabilities likely aren't one of them. But that's the reason this is so scary, because almost no one is paying attention. Unless you're okay with your city going full Detroit and giving more of your hard-earned money to pay off someone else's debts, stay with me. So what is a public pension liability? A pension is a guaranteed lifetime payment to someone after they retire. Pensions used to be a big deal in the private sector. Every major American company had them. But they became too expensive, and companies have taken steps to phase them out. However, pensions still live on in the public sector, among employees of the government, and they're eating city and state's budgets alive. More and more money that could go to tax cuts or better services is instead being shoveled aside to pay for these benefits. Why is this happening? Over decades, politicians have promised trillions of dollars in pensions to government workers. That includes police, firefighters, teachers, and city and state officials. You name a government job, and there's a pension associated with it. Now, you may be wondering, how big are these payments? Many pensions are quite large. In California, more than 62,000 retired public employees are receiving pensions of over $100,000 per year. Sometimes, it's even crazier. A retired New York City sanitation worker is getting $285,000 per year. A retired county administrator in California receives over $400,000 per year. Remember, these are guaranteed lifetime yearly payouts. Now, we love our public employees. They do vital work for our local communities and the wider society. They deserve competitive pay and retirement benefits. But currently, Many cities are, in effect, paying for multiple public departments at the same time. The department that's working now, and because people are living longer, a generation or two of retirees. The system amounts to a self-perpetuating, corrupt merry-go-round. Public sector unions give large donations to candidates, who are then responsible for negotiating how much of your money goes to public sector workers. These arrangements not only promise high salaries in the short term, but they also hide the payments that will be due down the road when it will be much too late. The results are predictable. State and local governments across the U.S. openly admit to $1.4 trillion of unfunded pension liabilities, or $11,000 per household. Unfunded means dollars that have been promised, but there's no actual money in the bank. And that's just the amount they admit to. The real number, according to the Federal Reserve, is much larger around $4 trillion, or $32,000 per household. Pensions have already thrown California cities like San Bernardino and Vallejo into bankruptcy, and the entire state of Illinois is teetering on the edge. So how do politicians get away with this? They use a time-tested political strategy. They lie. They lie by saying they can pay for more and more generous pensions, not by collecting more taxes, but by making investments at a guaranteed 7.5% return. But this is nonsense. It's less and less likely they'll meet their 7.5% goal over time. And their investment behavior, pouring ever more funds into ever riskier investments, suggests they know it. But if they were to use a more realistic assessment, they'd need to raise taxes dramatically. And they love their jobs too much for that. We can, however, turn the odds in our favor with public pressure, discipline, and common sense. Here's what needs to happen. First, we need state and local governments to report unfunded liabilities honestly, 
the real numbers using the 2 to 3% yields that sound financial reporting would require. No more pie in the sky stuff. The truth should shock voters into demanding action. Second, we must phase out the guaranteed pension programs as quickly as possible and introduce 401k plans. 401k plans, if designed properly, can provide excellent retirement benefits. These plans also have the advantage of being portable. If you leave the public sector and go work in the private sector, you get to take your money with you. In other words, you don't have to be locked in to a lifetime government job to receive retirement benefits. Win-win. Let's end the current structure of public sector pensions and move to a sustainable way of compensating our public workforce. Save your city, save your state, save your money. I'm Joshua Rao, professor of finance at Stanford and senior fellow at the Hoover Institution for Prager University. If you're counting on Social Security to finance your retirement, you're in for a big surprise and not the good kind. Let me give you two reasons why. One, Social Security is going broke. And two, even if it weren't going broke, it couldn't possibly cover the cost of a decent retirement. Let's look at these two reasons in a little more detail, and then I'll propose a solution. Social Security is going broke. When this government program was set up in 1935, the average life expectancy was 60. But you couldn't collect your first check until you reached 65. In other words, most people didn't live long enough to receive Social Security. And most of those who did, didn't collect it for very long. Today, the average lifespan is 79. So now, most people do live long enough to receive Social Security for 10 or 20 or even 30 years. Here's another important piece of information. When the program started, the ratio between worker and retiree was 159 to 1. That means for every one person drawing benefits, 159 were paying in. Today, the ratio is 2.8 to 1. You get that? We've gone from 159 workers supporting every retired person to fewer than three workers supporting every retiree. And it's going down. You don't need an advanced math degree to figure this one out. Social Security is spending more than it's bringing in. Far more. Its own Board of Trustees has said that it will be bankrupt within 20 years. That doesn't mean it won't exist. It means that either the government will pay you less than it promised, or it will have to raise taxes to make up the shortfall. Most likely, both. Sounds about right for an entitlement program, doesn't it? Starts out small, but just keeps growing and growing until it collapses under its own weight. But let's indulge in a fantasy and say that Social Security is perfectly designed, perfectly balanced, and efficiently run, and that you would get every dollar you were promised. You'd still have a major problem if that's all that you're relying on. To illustrate, in 2017, the average monthly Social Security check was a little over $1,400. That's under $17,000 a year, barely above the poverty line for a two-person household. Do you really want to live at the poverty line in retirement? Why in the world would you plan for that? But sadly, many people are. According to a recent study, 53% of unretired baby boomers have no retirement savings. That means they're planning to rely on Social Security for their retirement income. That's them. Don't let it be you. Here's the right way to prepare for retirement. First, get on a budget. I don't care if you're 55 or 25. I don't care if you're making $400,000 a year or $40,000 a year. You need to have a plan for your money. I love motivational speaker John Maxwell's line that a budget is simply telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. That means knowing before the month starts where every dollar you make is headed, whether it's the mortgage or rent or groceries or a car payment or whatever, you need to give every dollar an assignment. Second, Attack and avoid debt like the plague. Most Americans spend 25% of their income paying off debt. 
Imagine how much money you could save if you didn't have this albatross around your neck. Well, actually, you don't have to imagine. Again, it's simple math. A 30-year-old investing $500 a month in an investment fund with a 6% annual return will have over a million dollars by the time he's 70. So make a plan to get rid of your debt for good. I like the snowball method. List your debt smallest to largest, putting every extra dollar you have toward the smallest while making minimum payments on the rest. Once the smallest is paid off, roll that payment into the next smallest and do this until all of your debt is paid. Finally, put Social Security in perspective. Anything you get from it should be considered a fringe benefit, icing on the cake, not the cake itself. There's nothing wrong with getting Social Security checks. After all, you earned it by contributing to the system all those years. But there is nothing secure about Social Security. The last thing you want to do is rely on it. If you do, well, good luck. I'm Chris Hogan for Prager University.